Hello, I'm Deborah Stein, Professor of the Practice in Engineering and Public Policy and Associate Director of the Scott Institute for Energy Innovation at Carnegie Mellon University. I'd like to welcome you to this video on benefit cost analysis. This is part of a series of videos on policy analysis and related analytical methods. In this video, Dr. Granger Morgan, Hammerschlag Professor of Engineering at Carnegie Mellon's Engineering Public Policy Department, provides an overview of this analysis method, which has been a long time focus of his research. In previous videos that describe the policy analysis process, we've spoken about using the 4E criteria, effectiveness, efficiency, equity, and ease of political acceptability to analyze potential policy options. Benefit cost analysis is one way to analyze the efficiency of different policy proposals to identify the option that is most economically optimal for a desired societal outcome. After watching this video, you will be able to explain why benefit cost analysis is important, to identify some key elements of a benefit cost analysis, and discuss the differences between a good and poor benefit cost analysis. So thank you, uh, Dr. Morgan, for joining us today to talk about benefit cost analysis. So let's just start out with that question. What is benefit cost analysis? A benefit cost analysis is a method to choose the option that has the highest net benefits. So, for example, for project one, I add up all the benefits, and then I subtract off all the costs, and that's the net benefit for project one. And similarly, for project two, I add up all the benefits, I add up all the costs, and I take the difference, and that's the net benefit for uh, project two. And then I select the one that has the higher net benefits. And that sounds simple. So what are the key elements of a benefit cost analysis? Well, of course, the devil is in the details. Uh, this is especially true of estimating benefits where it's important to consider something called consumer surplus. So suppose we have a project like a free footbridge and a couple million people are going to walk over this footbridge. And so as the uh, slide shows, I got this little guy here who's going to collect a toll uh, for everybody who crosses the bridge. And if the toll is just a penny, 330,000 people are willing to pay it. If it's two cents, an additional 294,000 people would be willing to pay that much more, and so on, down the list. And so in each case, what I've done is multiply the number of people who are willing to pay that toll by the cost of that toll, and I've added it all up. To put it simpler, uh, whenever I buy something at the store, the value to me may be much greater than what I'm being charged, and so we're trying to add up all that additional value to include in a benefit cost analysis. Now, this was first figured out by a French engineer named uh, Jules Dupuis in 1844, but this idea of consumer surplus has now become standard in modern economics and is routinely used in benefit cost analysis. Another issue that arises in benefit cost analysis, of course, is that while some people may benefit, other people may actually incur costs. And so how do we deal with that? Well, there's a standard strategy which asks do the number of people who are getting benefits have enough benefit that they could compensate the people who have incurred costs? And if the answer is yes, then the, the particular choices or the strategy is assumed to be net beneficial. Problems arise, of course, in that economists often argue that as long as that case occurs, that's all you have to do. That is, that you don't actually have to have the transfer from the people who are benefiting to the people who are uh, incurring costs. And this is a more general issue that arises in many benefit cost analyses. Benefit cost analysis is basically a strategy to assure efficiency. It's nowhere near as concerned about issues of assuring equity. And yet in political discussions, equity is often considered much more important than issues of efficiency. So that's one limitation to the method. But the method does at least give one an insight about whether or not, uh, in simple uh, uh, terms, the net benefits outweigh the net cost. Can you give an example of why benefit cost analysis is important to public policy decisions? Yeah, there are a number of reasons. First of all, of course, we want to spend our resources in the public domain, and probably in the private domain as well, in a way that's most efficient. And 
though we do want to worry about equity, we also want to worry that we're not spending, we're not wasting money. And so benefit cost analysis is one strategy to make sure that the things we're investing in, in fact, are the most beneficial ways to be spending those resources. There has been a big growth in the use of benefit cost analysis in government uh, over the course of the past century. Back in the 1920s, the U.S. Corps of Engineers first began to use benefit cost methods to justify building dams or other uh, civil infrastructure. When they first started doing it, their methods were pretty uh, ad hoc. And then as more and more people got concerned because, you know, I want my bridge here and he wants his bridge there. And so we got into the details of the analysis. And at that point, economists got involved and began to uh, introduce all these sorts of ideas like uh, uh, Pareto optimality and uh, uh, consumer surplus. And so the methods got more and more precise. Then there was a period when uh, benefit cost analysis began to enter the political arena where people who were concerned, for example, about regulations started arguing, well, you need to do a benefit cost analysis for any environmental or health or safety regulation before the government should start imposing costs on society. And so in 1981, the Reagan administration introduced uh, an executive order, 12291, which said for any major rule that the federal government promulgates, uh, I must do a benefit cost analysis or the agencies must do a benefit cost analysis. Subsequently, other administrations have introduced similar rules and so it is still the case today that any major regulation promulgated by the U.S. government must be subjected to a benefit cost analysis. Now the picture that I've shown uh, here is the picture of the old executive office building next to the White House and it's of course the place that houses the office of OMB that's responsible for overseeing and assessing the value of the benefit cost analyses that different agencies conduct. Benefit cost analysis has become uh, very controversial over the years with many uh, people with different political views uh, arguing for and against. And as I said before, one of the big issues is that it's really only a method to assure efficiency as opposed to a method of assuring equity. And many political uh, discussions are fundamentally about issues of equity. Uh, so what's the difference between a good and a poor benefit cost analysis? A poor analysis might leave out many of the factors that are important, or it might not use good modern economic methods. Uh, it's also important to recognize that while benefit cost analysis uh, is focused on efficiency, in real decisions we often care about things other than efficiency like equity, and so it's important to make it clear that a benefit cost analysis is guidance, but that we shouldn't make our decisions just on the basis of the results of benefit cost analysis. Sometimes, of course, the uh, Congress mandates programs. So, for example, in the case of uh, uh, those video displays on the dashboard so that you can see uh, when you're backing up, uh, Congress has said all new cars must have that, but because there are rules by the Office of Management and Budget that say that any new rule, any major rule, has to be subjected to a benefit cost analysis. Uh, the Department of Transportation struggled to produce a benefit cost analysis that showed that this was cost beneficial. Of course, what they used in that analysis was their standard numbers for the uh, investment to prevent low probability deaths like uh, whether or not to put in a traffic light or whether to put in bumpers at, at the places where you have off-ramps. And they acknowledge in, in the piece that maybe a backing over your grandkid uh, ought to be treated a little differently. And those sorts of considerations are always allowed when government uses uh, uh, benefit cost analysis. It, it's not the basis for making a decision. It's guidance or advice on uh, a broader consideration of the decisions that, that government faces. So can you summarize the key points of, of what you told us today about uh, benefit cost analysis? Yeah, benefit cost analysis is a method to make decisions or choices on the basis of the net benefits of a proposed project, that is, the benefits minus the costs. 
And doing that involves quite a lot of detailed uh, methods in terms of assessing both benefits and costs. Modern economic theory has come up with quite a lot of detailed uh, approaches on how to do such analysis. All major regulations by the U.S. government now must be subjected to a benefit-cost assessment, but that's not the end of the story uh, for two reasons. Sometimes there are other factors that an agency needs to consider, and in some cases, like for example air pollution rules under the Clean Air Act, uh, the enabling legislation actually precludes one using benefit cost as the basis for making the decision, but nevertheless the Office of Management and Budget thinks that it's appropriate that for all such rules we at least have some sense of what the costs are that we're incurring and what the net benefits look like. Well, thank you very much uh, today, Dr. Morgan, for telling us all about benefit cost analysis. Thank you for watching, and I encourage you to watch the other videos in this series.